this point, I'd like to introduce a Greta Peterson, who designed and created, executed, and ironed, and hung, and did a lot of things with these papers. Greta? Love Unknown, which I, I personally really like. 
you can see the verse that is included here that I really wanted to tie to the design. And what I would mention about this, of course, the purple is common for the season of Lent, and then the, the thorns are in the state that they're really connected to Lent. And it's difficult to see here, and, and rather subtle, I think, in all of the banners, but each of the banner has a really subtle, almost hidden message. And this one is, you can see a heart in the middle of the banner. There is a heart. My song is Love Unknown. And it's it's the talk about that uh, season of Lent it can be sort of, I don't know if gruesome is the right word, but very morbid, but it's really about the love of God in the sacrifice of Christ for us. And then also about our own love, which is refined through suffering. And so I like that theme of having the heart at the center of the banner. And wanted to point out that this banner was given uh, by President Emeritus, Dr. Paul Zimmerman. Uh, he actually died after he uh, commissioned this banner. He didn't pass away. He dedicated this banner in memory of his wife, Mrs. Genevieve Zimmerman. So uh, Dr. Zimmerman now is in eternal life, but he felt it important to sponsor this banner <coughs> and on behalf of the university uh, support especially worship. And with that in mind, I'd like to point out that all of the previous presidents, living presidents, um, all contributed to uh, this project. Anything else about that? Can you talk about, talk about the black and the brown? Or? Sure, I, I could. Um, I tried to incorporate, as we'll see in the future designs, that they all have um, at least more than one color involved, so two or more. Um, so the idea be behind this is that it, it originally was all black, but um, I wanted the significance of sin and whatnot, but if you know, thorns are brown. So we have the realistic aspect, but then also the, the significant aspect of our sin. And we definitely need a savior. So that's Lent. Um, the next one I designed was the red banner. Um, it's for church and martyrs, and then also the day of Pentecost. Um, and uh, we praise you and acknowledge you. Oh God is the uh, hymn that I decided to. Red, we, of course, like Red has said, we think about the day of Pentecost, but other festivals of the church, such as Reformation, for example, commissionings and ordinations and installations, um, this color of red is used. Uh, it is um, used also for those, when we remember those saints that have been martyred, red being, of course, the color for blood. Um, I like the text here. May we with saints be numbered where praises never end and glory everlasting. Amen, O oh Lord, amen. So that's that connection with the saints uh, that are in eternal life. And also the church, sing with the holy church throughout all the world of this song. So there's a, a number of great connections with that in text. The more subtle piece, do you see it? Does everybody recognize what's there? You see easily the flames. What else do you see there? Yeah, you see the dove. Um, I, I, uh, I loved this connection from the very beginning because this red banner is used in those times when both the Holy Spirit and fire are associated. Uh, so I thought that was an excellent touch. And um, this banner was given by Ted and Nancy Lambs. Their generosity, especially in Thanksgiving for the 150th, but also for the many, many, many relatives <laughs> that they have had that have gone through this is at least nine. At least nine, right? Nine relatives. So thank you very much to Ted and Nancy for your generosity. All right. So next is for the season of Pentecost, which is green. Um, it's the one that's up a lot. Um, I actually call this my all-star banner because somehow every time it goes up, it looks great, which is fantastic. Um, just it goes up so much. Um, I, I used the, the hymn, Oh Blessed Spring, um, to go along with it, and just, um, as Pastor Jeff will explain, just the whole idea of growth and um, water in the Word, so that's, that's kind of what it should be. Yeah, that's the season uh, of Pentecost, not the day, but the season, it used to be called Trinity season, but this whole season of Pentecost, green for growth, it's the, it's the non-festival half of the church here, so that's that time of year when we think about the growth of Christians and the growth of the Christian church. And so what better image than the tree? Um, and 
the, the color green. And you'll notice in the second here is the three leaves, which also are droplets of water. Three droplets of water. What could that possibly make reference to? Baptism, of course, yeah. Um, and how appropriate for the season of Pentecost, baptism. And so this hymn, O blessed spring, where word and sign embrace us into Christ the vine, your Christ enjoins each one to be a branch of his life-giving tree. Um, and then in the second stanza there it says, water, word and water, thus revive, and join us to your tree of life. So the, the tree is a very common image throughout the scripture, but used particularly in the season of Pentecost. And we give thanks to God for Gary and Elizabeth Burns, who commissioned this piece, made this band possible. And just a little uh, sidelight, uh, Dr. Burns said, that why don't we do the Pentecost, season of Pentecost band, because it will be up a long time. Uh, so I'll, get, uh, I'll get my money's worth. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Gary and Elizabeth. I came in with the imagery of the city. This is one that um, the first three were pretty easy to come along. Uh, the last three, I had a little bit more of a process, especially working with the committee a lot on the designs. Um, if you notice through all, all the designs, there's something continuous going on. So there's one crown of thorns or one bramble of thorns, but multiple thorns involved. Or lots of flames, one fire, lots of leaves, one tree. So here we have lots of buildings, one city. Um, so, um, and then we have some other symbols in there. Yeah, Advent is a very difficult uh, season to capture in an image because it has layers and layers of themes. We think about the, the anticipation of Christmas itself, the anticipation of the coming of Christ at the end of all time. Uh, you have ideas of both repentance and also hope. Um, uh, preparation. I mean, there's uh, lots of things. So this was a really challenging one. Um, I think we we like the idea of, um, of a city uh, waiting. This kind of idea of waiting. Um, the star that is connected with a, a candlelight in one of the windows. And for us, that was this connection for hope. Um, and uh, this there was given uh, by uh, President Emeritus. Eugene Fritz and his wife, and they had not had a chance to see it yet, um, but I did show him some copies of it, and he was very pleased with the result of this. So I wanted to thank the Krenzes for the contribution for this. There's one more symbol in here, there were a lot, um, especially the road that leads up to the city. Um, and while the banner itself is blue, um, like you may have mentioned, Advent used to um, to remind us of our sin. Um, so then the road itself is purple because there's a road leading up to Bethlehem um, as well as the road leading to the cross um, that Jesus was born to walk. So um, I made the road purple just for that significance to remind us that Lent will be So So both, uh, I think both a, a season of repentance purple and the season of hope were encapsulated in this image. It's cool too with the leaves in the shape of the star because it almost looks like a cross a little bit. Like yeah, so we can just mention that to yeah. me. It's not exactly, you know, designed for that purpose, but it's, it's kind of interesting when people will come up to me and say that they see that I wasn't planning on. So that's kind of a cool aspect. Um, this is the one that's up right now, so some of you may recognize it. It's for resurrection. He is risen. <laughs> he is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Yeah, so, um, I can't sing it loud enough. It is so great. Um, I just I love the chorus, the, the refrain, and uh, so this was another difficult one to come up on, but um, I, I do really like the results. Yeah, when you think of Easter, we think of lilies, uh, and that's a symbol of that empty tomb, the open tomb, but also at the same time a trumpet, which is associated the season of Easter. And these are called what kind of lilies? Calla? Calla. Calla. Calla lilies, which I didn't even know existed before. I learned not through this whole project. Um, yeah. um, and so you have the calla lilies, but they're also sort of trumpet-like in uh, the proclamation the, the angels the, the empty tomb. You'll notice also the, the sort of more subtle message here 
is, if you look carefully, there's a butterfly. There's this, mm -hmm. this stem, or whatever they call this, the antennae, and then the wings of a butterfly. And of course, the butterfly has long been associated as a symbol for the resurrection. So each one of these has something quite more obvious. A lily is you know, the resurrection, and then something more subtle. The butterfly is also a symbol of the resurrection. Um, and wanted to say a special thanks to uh, Frank R. and Lois Catrimbone family who dedicated this banner. Um, Frank passed away last year, and so I thought very appropriate to have the banner of the resurrection, which he believed in and knew and understood uh, to be associated with Frank and Lois. So thank you very much, Frank and Lois, for your contribution. All right, and the last design is Incarnation, or Christmas. Um, from heaven above to earth I come. I just found it very appropriate. Um, written by Luther, I believe. And just like, it's like the whole story of the angel coming and telling Mary what's going to happen. And that's kind of, um, you know, the significance of the message. Yeah, this, this matter was, a, we struggled with this one. I mean, I, we was, this is all happening in summer and people are trying to take vacations and I was off in Ely, Minnesota at, at the uh, wolf exhibit on the phone and Greta and we're talking and I'm like, manger, manger, I, I see a manger. And, and then uh, they're just sort of sending me uh, my, my, my phone these different images and we had her all confused. And then she just decided to do exactly what she wanted to anyway. Which is, <laughs> so, um, so this, of course, you think of the, the incarnation. The, the tricky part of the incarnation is how, how do you possibly encapsulate in an image the true God and true man, you know? I mean, it's just, what do you do with that? You know, and we thought a manger may be too obvious, um, but I really like the way this one turned out. In fact, I think it's probably my favorite. Of course, you have a trumpet, the angels, Claiming the birth of Jesus. You got strong and not a man. And the, yes, maybe you can see a little bit of strong. Um, and those are the wings, the wings of, it, of the angel. Um, perhaps a um, one can maybe see a, a angel with, you know, the angels have three sets on each side, and you sort of see those three sets of uh, wings, or you can see multiple of angels. But also, you'll notice. Um, you want to point it out? She, yeah, I lost <laughs> it. This is probably one of the hardest It's very subtle. So this way is, you know, vertical, but if you visually turn it to be horizontal, you can see a dove again. So so here's the, the beak, and then we got the wings going off. Yeah. yeah. When we think about the incarnation and the Holy Spirit um, mm -hmm. uh, hovering over Mary and giving her uh, her wound to the baby Jesus, so that's a great connection for so, so that was the description of the design. Um, just going a little bit into the process, because it was quite a process. Um, first, it started out by scouting. This is just a picture of the chapel from the back. And you'll see that this is um, one of the, the banners um, that had been created previously. Um, so the idea was, okay, we want the banners, but we're not quite sure what we want them to look like on the scale, and are they going to go in the same place, and you know, what, what all is going to go around there. So I personally really liked the aspect of, of where the banner already was. Um, the cross, if you can kind of see it in this picture, is asymmetrical. You know, it's on one side of the stained glass, not smack dab in the middle. So I thought the, the banner on one side really balanced it out well. So I really liked the dimensions of the old banner, so I decided to keep them. But I did switch up um, the structure, um, as you can see. There's, Five vertical panels, um, each a foot wide, so it still ended up being five by about 22 feet total. So, which is, it's really big. <laughs> when when it's up there, you know, the chapel is huge. But when you get it down on the floor or in somebody's living room, for example, this is not. This is not it was the entire room. yeah dining room through the piano room, just kind of barely fit in there. So <laughs> it was pretty big. Um, so different fabrics that were involved. The fabric that you see is linen. Um, I chose it because um, it has good integrity. There are lots of different colors, so it wouldn't have to be restricted um, by, by the ones that were available with, with the other materials. Um, as you can see, this is Professor Herman right here, um, who helps me out a lot. But 
really the hands-on project that she helped me out with was that there is an accent panel. Um, the fourth panel, the longest panel for all of them, is actually dyed for um, some, of, some of them, which um, took, we, we took uh, a, a panel and then we put it in black dye, um, as you can see that, that she's doing right here. And what that helped us do is that I really didn't want there to be a lot of seams. I didn't want to piece together the banners. I wanted the panels to be full lengths of fabric. So it would require us to buy an entire, um, another eight yards of a darker color fabric, and that just would be kind of a waste in my opinion. So we just decided to take the ones that we already had. We could get six panels out of two lengths of eight yards, and so we could take one of those and just dye it darker. So that's what, what some of them are. Um, that's where we get the darker color. So um, Professor Herman isn't here right now, but I really appreciate her help on that. Um, the, the inside of the, the banners is felt. So that's what kind of gives it that, that structure, um, able to, to kind of uh, withstand being handled a lot. This was, wow, it's, it's really, really thick. So um, what my dad actually came up with is that there's this giant straight edge that you could piece together for actually wood cutting, I think. Um, and so I just used that with my rotary blade um, so that we could just have just really, really straight panels because that's the only way that this ban these banners would work. Um, at first, I did try with the scissors. Um, we had a trial and error banner, actually, that we started out with, but we ended up recreating the entire thing because it just did not work out. So trial and error, absolutely, but we did eventually come up with this. So that was worked. one of the trips it to Minnesota and back. Yeah, it was, it was a little bit of a letdown, um, but you know, eventually we just kind of figured some, th some things out and uh, went from there. So it was really, really straight, but then as you can see, this is a picture of my dining room and my piano room and uh, just lots and lots of felt fabric everywhere. So thank you for the sacrifice of that room for summer. Um, this, so as, in terms of the very beginning of the design process, it started out with sketching. Um, as you know, I designed the left banner first, so that's in that corner. And it look, it's kind of hard to determine what it is because it's actually on um, my Good Friday bulletin from my uh, church. I was just really inspired during the sermon, and so <laughs> I, I sketched it on, on, on to the bulletin. Um, and so, uh, what, what happens from there is that then I would I would take a picture, these are all pictures, and then I'd trace it in um, Adobe Illustrator, um, and then go on to the projection process. But that's how all of the designs originate. I really liked the idea of actually sketching things out, because you can, the computer can be kind of limited, so I really liked the ability to you know, sketch and expand on actual paper. Um, so there are some sketches that became the banners. Then there's a projection piece of it. The question is, how do you go from an image that's like this big to a banner that's like huge, right? So um, I was able to design the banners, as you saw, and then I printed them onto projection sheets. Um, do, I don't know if people remember what a projector is, but um, <laughs> basically I, I was able to back it up to a point where on the wall it was to scale. So um, once I got to that point, put down tape, and that's what I did for the rest of the banners. Um, and then I could move the sheet around however I wanted it, as long as the projector stayed where it was, so it was all on scale. Um, and then I'd have, you can't really see it, but there's, there's a skinny sheet of something called Wonder Under. Um, and this is, it's a material that um, when, you, when you cut it out, you can iron it onto another piece of fabric and then um, peel it off, and then peel off the backing. It's kind of like double stick tape. And then you can put it onto another piece of fabric, iron it over, and it transfers and it will stay. Um, the reason for this, because it kind of was a headache, um, is that not only could we get the design in pieces, um, but then we were able to lay down the pieces and then move them to go sew them. Um, so this, this is the process, but it goes into the satin pieces because um, see, you can see all these pieces of, of under under. Okay, I sew it onto the back of satin. Um, they all have little symbols on them because it really was a giant puzzle to put back together. Um, so I would I'd cut them all out and then um, peeled off the back and, and put it onto the, the length of linen. And then took an iron and I ironed it all down. 
picked up the individual pieces and kind of lightly folded them up so then I could take them home and actually sew them down because the applique process with the really tight zigzag, that's what made them permanently stitched. I didn't just want them to be stickers, I wanted them to be you know, sewn down. So that's where the applique came into um, practice. Marta helped me out with this, as you can see her in the picture. Um, so literally everything um, then is just a, a tight zigzag. And um, for me, the really nice thing is that we could use machines. The, the past banners that were done were all hand sewn. Um, and so I really, really appreciate that part because of how long it took me with the machine. Can't really imagine how long it took other people without the machine. So um, we were able to just kind of permanently get them all down. And um, so I, I especially thank my sister for what she helped with on that. But then once we had the design down on one piece of linen, then um, what I had to do is I took um, cotton is the back of the banner. So then I sewed right sides to right sides, and I turned it up like a giant long pillowcase, basically what happened, um, with openings on either end. So then um, you can see that I'm, I'm turning it inside out here. And then I don't have a picture of this, actually, but, but the process that my mom and I came up with is that then we need to take two layers of felt and basically run it through this giant sleeve pillowcase. And um, we just kind of had a, a system, it's kind of hard to describe, it's just um, a, a cardboard, um, a bolt of fabric comes on a piece of cardboard. So then that was about the width of, of these, these long um, pieces. And so then we were able to clamp it on with a hanger and just kind of uh, take it and I, you know what, it's been so long that I don't yeah. remember, but magically the belt went through and um, the point of not sewing the applique to the felt was that as the fact the linen relaxes, then it wouldn't get bunched on, on the felt. So we wanted it to be able to kind of hang loosely in there and only be attached to the top and the bottom so that um, they wouldn't fight, because that's what we found with the very first panel. They really, really fought, so we had to rethink that um, and separate the two. So that's kind of the idea. I know it's kind of confusing, but you can see that it worked out basically as we had planned in the end. Um, so then I did all of this at home. So then um, I needed to get it to Chicago. And this guy um, <laughs> held up a lot in terms of going back and forth. Um, and also, with the whole, um, before the Banner Boys were established this past year, Pastor Jeff was the original Banner Boy. And um, I tell you, he had to be so strong to just go up and down and up and down. And if you can see my pose, it's a fairly critical pose, <laughs> which meant that there was a lot of, of um, hoisting that was required. So, so thank you so much for going through that. Um, and yeah, when we got here, there was, there was still a lot of work to be done with finishing off the tops and the bottoms because I couldn't do that at home. I needed the setting of the chapel. So um, when we got there, I, I actually just recently, it, it kind of continued into this year. It wasn't just a summer project. The finishing off kind of happened on a ban per banner basis. So recently, like a month ago, I actually finished off the whole process by finishing off the Lent banner, which was the, the last one to go up. So, um, as you can see, here's two pictures of the finished product, and then, of course, the resurrection one that's up in the chapel. Um, this was for opening service. Um, it was just how Bethany and I had envisioned it. We, we just, we, one day, before they were even done, we just walked to the chapel, and we're like, we can, we can just see it. A bright, bright red banner with dove, flames, the works. It's going to be so beautiful, and opening service came. And that's what it looked like. And it was just, it was wonderful. So along with all the carnations and azaleas and roses and whatnot that went along with it, it was just, it was, it was very beautiful. Um, and then this was featured in the alumni newsletter, I think. Um, so then that was, that was the green one that, uh, that was so sweet. So I just want to give a final thank you. <laughs> So we have some questions, if anybody has questions to Greta or myself. Also in the back we have uh, a recent Forrester article that has the picture of all six of them and a little bit of information. Uh, but we'll have to take some questions and then I'm going to ask uh, Professor Herman and Professor Kouros also have uh, some brief words. Any questions about the process or the background?
manners themselves, so the theology of the liturgy behind them. I noticed that you use a lot of like Trinitarian images too, like with three lilies and three trumpets. And then, <laughs> um, was that like deliberate or did it just kind of like I thought that was really cool, just like even looking at the resurrection banner. Really cool. Yeah, I think that just like artistically, that that I wonder uh, some things were just done artistically, but then they just happened to work out liturgically as well. I think that just might have been one of those where it was just. You know, room for three lilies and, and three trumpets and whatnot. Three is also my favorite number, so I don't know if that subconsciously went in the process. Um, but I, yeah, I guess that's just one more thing that kind of went back. So, so thank you for doing that. Any other questions? I thought the colors were inspired colors, actually. And for colorists, your Lenten banner is olive, the prince of peace. And olive or green is the color of your banner for martyr and festival to choose that to begin your school year when you up your weeks. Education is not the filling of a bucket, it's the lighting of a fire. It's the start. I loved your choice of the deep blue for Advent. It ruins the color of faith. Your choice for for Lent. The new color of the millennium, or the color chosen for the millennium, is the violet thing, the purple the violet. So the, the timing of it is wonderful. And just the, your accent color, you know, the, the longest color, the accent color, because your eyes are drawn in, and then it goes out. And your colors for Christmas, and your colors for Direction, white for purity and goodness and resurrection, basically. Just wonderful work, beautiful work, inspiring. Thank you so much. I can't take all the credit um, because I, I think that it's you know, traditional to follow these colors, but just the, the shades of the colors yes. that yes. I, was, I was able to find. Yes, it was just drawn to the gift of God. <laughs> And I, I should mention that the, the banner and the pyramids are two separate things. And mm -hmm. we, we were talking about how do we match the pyramids, do we try to match the pyramids. And we just decided we're going to do the banner and see what happens and then tackle the pyramids another time. So if anybody has any great ideas about all of the pyramids, the, the altar <laughs> hangings, we can adjust those in the future. <coughs> other questions for Brad or myself? Um, I know. As I saw the project unfold, there were some very difficult stages in this that, that were that were seemingly very they were very difficult. Can you comment on on how some of those difficulties were overcome? Yes. So the did, did you feel that God was helping you oh, in this process? He must have been because that's, that's the only way for this to, to come through. The, I think the biggest difficulty that we faced. Like I said, the first three banners, the first the three designs, they just came into place. I don't, they just were initial inspiration, which is really good because, you know, the summer started and we needed to start making these. Um, so it's really good that those are in place. But the last three were very difficult. Um, I, I wanted to have them all have a similar style and, you know, not to be um, just putting, you know, a bunch of symbols just kind of up there and, um, while they're significant, I just didn't really think that those were what, what I, I wanted to go with. So the difficult part, the most difficult part that I had was designing, but then also producing at the same time. Because um, that's what ultimately those last three were um, designed to work. I, didn't, I was nervous that I was taking too much time on the design process, and I was neglecting the project production because I only had a summer to do this which was about a banner per week. So I didn't want to rush the design process, but I also had the production in the back of my mind to do. Um, so definitely really lean on the community for that. Um, just emailing designs back and forth. Um, and I suppose um, some of the ones just kind of, I guess they came to me and the only way I think that was possible was just 
praying for inspiration, and it's just not a thing that can be rushed, but um, God gave it to me just in time in a matter of some of these, so that I wouldn't hold up perfection. Now, how we mentioned how difficult it is for an artist to work with a committee, uh, because committees <laughs> are three different people that have all these different ideas. Great ideas. Yeah, great ideas, <laughs> but you have one artist, you know, so this is probably the last time she'll ever work with a committee. <laughs> and now she's like, I'm going to do this, and you've got to be okay with it, you know, so, but that's a, that's a tricky process. You've got everybody's got different opinions and thoughts. Plus, I had to come in, like, you know, I wouldn't just be doing these, not just the committee would be doing these, but so many different people. So that's why I definitely needed a committee so that they could, you know, kind of check in on that. I, it couldn't just be what I thought looked good, it had to be a combination. So, um, so thank you to those committee members that were kind of, kind of my back on that. I really appreciate that. I'm wondering if you are having your signature and your name put on each banner too. Yeah. Um, <laughs> apparently no. Um, or signed? You know, I haven't signed them yet. Um, I suppose that might be a good idea, somewhere putting my mark on these because I won't be here forever. Um, <laughs> I had to graduate next spring. Um, so, I, yeah, I guess I never really thought of that. Um, but perhaps Professor Herman will help me with that and um, how to go about doing that on a textile. Yeah, thank you for this. Good suggestion. Yeah. Other questions before we turn it over briefly? Yes, Marta. I just want to know I'm being part of the process. I just wish you'd touch a little bit on getting the designs to line up through the process. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so initially, when we had talked about the design, it was just kind of like, what would happen if we just, you know, somehow cut out this big piece of fabric and just laid it on the panels and then just kind of, you know, cut where the panels ended? or what would happen if, you know, it was it was five panels, kind of, but it, they weren't separate, they were just divided by a seam. Um, and I guess what we decided to do was definitely have five distinct panels, but that really created a lot of difficulty because, I thought I might have to explain this, it's, a tr it's tricky. Um, there's something called seam allowance. So in order not to have raw edges everywhere, you have to tuck them into a seam. And so the issue is that if you have a curve, for example, and you just want this curve to go in between two panels, you need to be able to have two pieces that actually overlap somewhere. So that this can go into a seam and this can go into the seam, and when you put it together, they still line up. And that, yeah, that was another really difficult part of the process, because you kind of had to anticipate where the seam was going to go. and. Um, uh, it's, and also, whenever I, when I laid it out and put out this giant puzzle, the fabric had to be stretched as if it was up on, uh, hanging up. And that was very hard to simulate because I didn't have gravity on my side. So when you do put them up in the shaft, they're really heavy. They even have weights at the bottom. So they had to be lined up so that hopefully, when it looks great on the floor, when we put it up, it also looks great, you know, hanging. So. Um, that was a process, you're right, that I really had to go through and, and line things up, uh, you know, create multiple pieces for, for one, one, uh, one, one curve, uh, a wing, uh, a piece of a lily, it had to stretch across multiple panels, and that, that was, <laughs> was difficult. I don't, I don't regret it. I, I think, I do like, like the five panels coming together kind of, you know, individual pieces, but unified together. Um, it was just one of those difficult things that I had to work through. So. Crisis is the word that comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult to get all the pieces registered. It was, it was extremely difficult. Well, I remember also the, um, the wrinkling of them. You know, we, when they were, we couldn't figure out how to get this fabric to look smooth and now we were great. And it's a lot yeah. of, <laughs> the original original banner, because I eventually I, I did seven in fact. I did the red one twice. The first time I did it, we kinda had the idea, well, if we just put wonder under that, that iron on material in between the linen and the felt, that there's no way that it could wrinkle because they'd just be cemented together. 
and that's what's going to happen. We're going to hang them up, and it's going to look great because it looks. We ironed it. it. We it looks great. We rolled it up on barrels. It still looks fantastic. And then we got to Chicago, and we unrolled it, and there was all this puckering all over, just where where it had kind of pulled away at pieces at parts, and I guess it got you know kind of stretched, and then when you you kind of unstretched and unrolled it, then it, it really reacted, and. So that was that was something that I, I really I, I didn't do a um, kind of a test, so to speak. I, I really thought that was going to work, but it didn't. So then we had to come we had to come up with a different process. We were nervous that if we just applied to a single layer of linen, that then the linen would get all all wrinkled and and pucker up. Um, so, but that was the process that ultimately worked. So we were all kind of holding our breath when we brought the second banner. I actually did a test panel in my church. My church is not nearly as, as tall. It doesn't have that, that tall of a space. But um, we came up with a system where we could hang it, and it looked good. Put it all together in a banner, banner held a breath, and that was the system that we went with. So I believe we were able to get something by the end of it to work. So. Right now, I was in a couple of meetings, and I uh, know I will probably say things that have already been said. <coughs> So bear with me on that. Um, I worked with Brad, um, with the committee throughout the process, um, and just have to say that as you can begin to under understand what this whole entire process, especially the execution portion of it, took was absolutely incredible, and um, I don't think even though you saw the presentation to really understand fully what, what she went through with the execution process, uh, it just blows my mind. Um, as a fiber artist myself, uh, I don't, I, I kept saying, I don't know if I'd do this. I don't know, I don't know, I'd have to figure this out. It would take me two years to figure this out. Uh, and so I just really give you a ton of credit, Greta, um, for a variety of things. Just, um, I guess first and foremost, uh, your willingness to even take this on. It is something that a lot of people, myself included, would probably shy away from or really have to think about before doing it. Uh, your vision for it, knowing uh, ahead of time that it could look this way or it could look that way, maybe it'll look this way, but but I'm, I'm in it. I'm in it to the end and I'm gonna make this work. And I know I said a couple of times, that if anybody can do this, Freddie can do this. And I don't think the committee on one occasion lost faith in you. We, we always knew that you had the skills and certainly the maturity to work through um, those challenges, which will always occur. So tons of credit to you on uh, that behalf. And then um, to see that vision through and to work the design and and even working with us as a committee. I know design by committee firsthand and it is a position that um, can be difficult at times. Um, and you just have to really stay focused and as a, an artist sometimes you compromise your own design sense because you're, you want to satisfy the committee. And I very much appreciated you standing strong on some of your design decisions when we were saying, mm, maybe a different shape, whatever. And that paid off, and not only did it pay off, um, we learned from it as well. We as faculty members learned from that. So again, just um, tons of credit to you. You have certainly blessed the Concordia community. Uh, those who sit in uh, the chapel and worship have been blessed by what you have visually presented to us. So thank you so much for all of that. It was a real pleasure uh, to work with Greta. Uh, we dyed fabric on occasions uh, down in the art department that was used and uh, looked at swatches and all of that even before the ball got, got started. So um, uh, thank you for the gift that you've given us. <laughs>